In response to your question, sir, about the fraud cases and why we have not opened them, the, the reason for us not opening fraud cases is because we don't know who to lay fraud charges against. Is it against Sasa or is it against the people who have stolen our identities, who we actually don't know? So, so at the moment, we, we are seeking legal, legal advice on, in that regard. Thank you. Um, just to add on to what Mr. Cedras has said um, in regard to that, and it's, it's that we have no way of, of telling who these fraudsters are, um, and that's because the phone numbers which, which were used on our fraudulent SASA applications were not our own, um, and, and you guys might have heard of the, the RICA Act, the RICA Act which regulates telecommunications and states that, you know, back in, in, in the past, you know, you'd have to walk into a physical, like, shop give your ID and they would validate that, upload that to the database. But the truth is that there is re widespread RICA fraud currently in, in today's society, which, you know, does have to be overcome. And that's why we, we when we will, you know, engage further uh, with the investigation, we'll probably end up discovering that the phone numbers on our SASA applications are possibly to a person that is deceased or a, 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 a person... But go ahead and present. Good morning, honorable members, the portfolio committee, our honorable chairperson, and members of the, uh, oh, sorry, and the honorable minister. Today, me and Joel Cedras will be providing our presentation on a brief on our findings in the, in the SASA SRD system. Our agenda today is as follows. We're going to go through our introduction, methodology, legal frameworks used, our findings, and recommendations. Without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Joel to do the introduction. Good morning. My name is Joel Cedrus, and I'm sitting next to Via Gasai, and we are two first-year students studying computer science at Stellenbosch University. We are young, concerned students, citizens in this country. In February of this year, I tried to apply for the SOD grant, but to no avail. It said that I already had an application. Three weeks ago, I spoke to Veer about this, and we found out that Veer also has an application. And from here, we decided to find out what had happened with our applications. Our methodology is as follows. First, I, ha I held an informal on-campus verbal survey where we asked participants to enter their ID number so that we can check whether or not they have an SRD application active. If an application was found, we then asked whether or not they created that application themselves. We generated ID numbers using the ID algorithm and fed these into the SRD system. This system tells you whether or not an ID number has an application or not. And these results were then aggregated and from here we drew conclusions. We also compared these numbers with various relevant figures such as stats SA birth data and unemployment figures. We ended up identifying three complications in this process. Firstly, we found that there was no form of authentication on SASA's SRD portal. This allowed us to query the portal hundreds of thousands of times. Secondly, we suspected we found many suspected fraudulent applications. And thirdly, we feel that it is simply too easy at the moment to apply for the SRD grant, and this enables fraudsters to apply very easily. Throughout this process, we only used legal methods to gather our findings. This included the public SASA SRD portal. This portal is publicly available for anyone to use, and all we needed to check whether or not someone had an application was an ID number, which we then generated. How did we generate these ID numbers? Well, through visiting various government websites, this is completely publicized information. For those of you who don't know, ID numbers are generated in the following way. It's your year you were born, followed by the month, the day, four digits which will range from zero to 4,999 if you're female, then it goes from 5,000 to 9,999 if you're male, 
followed by 0, 8, um, and then a checksum digit which we can calculate using a little bit of math. We generated, uh, sorry, we, we created a, a program which allowed us to generate ID numbers sequentially, which we could then feed into the SASA system to get a response from. As part of our on-campus informal survey, we asked 60 people that we know to verbally participate in our survey. What they did was they entered their ID numbers into the portal and checked whether or not they have an application. Of these 60 people, 58 of them had active applications, and of those 58, 56 of them did not make the application themselves. We ran a few wider tests with the IDs we were able to generate, and the first test we were able to run was testing all 280,000 possible ID numbers for people born in February 2005. The data and results we got from this was we, were, we received positive impact from the, the, the public SASA system that there were 74,931 active applications for people born in February 2005. From Stats SA, we were told that there were 82,097 people born for that year. That correlated to an application rate of just over 91%. Highly unlikely when, when we look at unemployment, sorry, when we look at youth unemployment, which is at around about 60.8% as of the latest Stats SA report. The second mass scale test that we did was we tested the first possible 1,000 ID numbers for people who were born from the 1960s to 2006. What we found from this was there was an average application rate of about 52%. But when we look at the data from 1960 to 2001, there was a 50% application rate versus the application rate for people born from 2002 to 2006 was 90%. This is relevant because these are uh, people born from uh, 2002 to 2006 turned 18 when the system was implemented and are the most vulnerably targeted people that we think were, were, were being targeted in this, in this um, system. Let's look at mine and Joel's personal case. We, when we discovered that, that we had active SASA applications, obviously, you know, there, there was no way to guarantee whether we had been paid a SASA grant. But after digging in some more, we, we managed to find a hidden bank account on my ID number that I never opened up. And from this, I was paid out two SASA grants um, to my personal ID number that was stolen by the scammers um, and, and, and fraudulently transferred to their uh, bank accounts. This was very problematic in, in a few ways. Firstly, the, the SASA limit for whether a SRD grant can be paid is around about 624 Rand, which means if you have more than 624 Rand of bank account activity, or money in your bank account that is being transferred in or out, you should not automatically not be qualified for the SASA SRD grants and should be not paid out that. However, regardless of the fact, in July 2023 and November 2023, according to the SASA system, I was paid a, I was paid a, a SRD grant, even though I far exceeded the, the means income required and, and transacted in that month with more than 624 Rand in and out of my bank account. In my personal case, I turned 18 on the 30th of December last year. This year, in the first week of January, a bank account was made in my name and someone had created a SASA application with my ID number. We have numerous recommendations for SASA, but it's important to understand that we are not experts on this matter. We are simply concerned students who want to help. We recommend that SASA firstly looks at restarting the entire grant system. It seems like there are too many applications that are being made without people's knowledge, and we feel like it would be too difficult for SASA to detect all of these fraudulent applications. By, restart, by restarting the whole grant system, it allows for SASA to re-verify everyone, 
but with stricter verification processes in order to combat fraud. Secondly, you know, when it comes to stricter verification processes, we would like to see facial or biometric verification for everyone. Those who do not have smartphones who are capable of doing this should be able to go into their local SASA office to complete this verification. We understand that the people receiving these grants are of utmost vulnerability in this situation and that they need this money the most. Even if they do not have access to smartphone technology, they should still be able to verify themselves. The second thing is we advocate for further verification when creating an application. Currently, all you have to provide is your full name, your surname, and ID number to apply for an SRD application. This is not enough. We think that through certain, uh, through, by working with Home Affairs, that SASA can improve their systems by adding more validation that would leave fraudsters unable to create applications on people's names. The first suggestion we make is the smart card issue date. If you look at the back of your smart ID card, you'll see an issue date. The Department of Home Affairs does use this to validate that you are the holder of the, that ID card and could reduce fraud significantly as scammers would not be able to test every possible date. In addition to these recommendations, we also recommend that SASA implements rate limiting on their system. By rate limiting, we mean that you limit the amount of times a single device or IP address is able to make a request to the system. So for example, one device should not be able to make hundreds of applications in a day. In our testing, through one single device, we were able to make 700 requests a minute to the SASA server. That should not be possible. We, we strongly advocate that SASA should implement rate limiting per device. One single device on one IP address should not be allowed to make 700 requests to the server a minute. Finally, we really want to extend a hand to SASA and say that we are willing to collaborate and, and co-create in this situation. As Joel has stated, we are concerned citizens who would love to have additional input into the situation, and we, we just want to partner. Um, we think we'll be able to assist SASA in this matter, and um, by working with us, we can reform the SRD system to make sure that the most vulnerable people in South Africa are able to get this grant money who are the most in need of it. Thank you to the House. Thank you, um, Honourable Members. I think that was the last Honourable Member to comment and ask questions. Um, I will now uh, hand over back to uh, uh, Mr. Hossai and Mr. Citrus. 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 Uh, for their for their responses, uh, and you you would have obviously heard that most was the was the uh, comments, and if you could just also comment back because I, I believe the the honourable members are really looking for solutions, and so uh, more information towards what they have raised is is would be would be appreciated. Thank you so much. Over to you. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to thank the seven honorable members for, for giving us your very valuable and very, very good input in, in, in the situation and um, regarding our presentation. Um, and we'd just like to, you know, respond to, to a few of them and engage with you and, you know, to further gauge um, the, the impact you are requesting. So, um, to the first honorable member, uh, we, we thank you very much for your, for your input. Um, we are here today and were invited to present our findings on the SRD uh, grants in a layman's um, terminology so that everyone who is here um, understands what we are presenting. We would definitely like to personally provide to you, you know, technical specifications if you would like, but we are not in our capacity here today to do that, we are 
asked, we were asked to come here today to present just non-technical specifications on this. Um, secondly, we would like to address those allegations that we, we got from you about us hacking. We did not hack in, in this specific situation. We were, uh, in our slideshow, we clarified the legal methods we used, and to just reiterate, we would use the SASA publicly available systems to um, generate our data um, from, from, so we were able to put ID numbers in their system, publicly available, anyone could have done it, and get a response. Thirdly, in capacity of Poppy Act, um, we are not companies. Um, Poppy Act, if you, if you have read the law, um, only applies to public and private companies in capacity. We are acting here today as individuals um, and in a personal capacity, which means Poppy Act does not uh, stand any value in, in this investigation and briefing. Um, finally, we would love to welcome your idea of a report and in, in going into an investigation and we want, um, we, we support your idea of, of going to the department and asking them for an investigation to the situation and we, we thank you for that valid input and we support that. Sure, just give us a moment to... Um, further clarify some things. Okay, to continue with our, our feedback, we uh, are now going to move to our second honorable member um, who raised some, some questions and um, we thank you for your input. Um, the, the first thing we'd like to support is the cross-department use of, of information, right? Whether that's, you know, NASFIS being, being included, whether it's SARS, whether it's other government services that people are using, integrated into the SASA system because from my personal case, um, the Department of Social Development SASA system should have picked up the fact that I was receiving money more than 600 Rand in my bank account, um, that I am a registered taxpayer and that I, I, I did receive a paycheck in that month. So we, we'd love to, to support um, that idea and the, the department, you know, on, on interview with, with Mr. Van Frieda last week did claim that, you know, they are using these systems in place. Um, but secondly on that, with your idea of facial verification, and we, we completely support this. Um, we understand that SASA has told the public and came out publicly that this facial verification is in place. Um, but after our interview, Mr. Cedras did phone SASA um, as in a public capacity to the hotline and requested that can he get the SMS facial verification link um, so he can sort out his application and resolve the issue. Um, this was completed on um, last week. Uh, he'll, he'll probably break that down further when, when we go into the I think fourth MP's um, uh, response, but we did not get any facial verification link. We were told by the SASA person, the, the person on the call center, which we reached out to, that there is no system like this in place. Um, the EKYC or EID Verify facial system has not been put in place. We maybe can assume that maybe that people haven't been trained on it yet, and it might be in place, but that's just an assumption. And what we can factually tell you is we were told by Sasa on the phone that the system is not in place. Um, I'd like to now um, transfer over to my, my counterpart, Mr. Cedrus, to continue. Okay, in response to the DA honorable, honorable member, you, you, you asked us about our timeline, so I want to give you a, a, a timeline of the calls that I've made to the National SASA helpline. Um, and I made these calls in my personal capacity as a citizen, and I was trying to raise the issue of my identity having been stolen. So I made the first call on the 2nd of October, and in this call I was told that I would receive a response in 24 hours, a SMS link to verify myself. I then made two calls to the, to the hotline on the 11th of October, and 
the, the, the first set of these calls, I first tried to call their regional call centers, but what, what, what happened was I was unable to reach any regional office of SASA. All of their numbers either said that it does not exist or it would answer immediately, but there's no response on the other end. Then the, the, the final call was last week, Thursday, I believe, and in this call, I asked them if my application has been marked as fraudulent. To this date, my application is still not marked as fraudulent. And in this call, I also asked whether it would be possible to verify myself via the SMS link that was talked about on TV. The person on the other end told me that they do not have the system in place yet on their side. Then, in response to your second question regarding whether or not we've been approached by banks, uh, I would like to confirm that we have been approached by banks, but uh, we will not be, be naming those. Um, just a final thing to add to Joel uh, as a response to the, the Democratic Alliance MP. Um, you, you asked us if the, the students in the Stellenbosch University survey um, was uh, we, if we asked the students if they knew these grants were for, for destitute people. And as a response to that, we'd like to say that um, you know, many of these students who we, who we verbally consented to this didn't even know what SASA is. Um, we had to explain to them that, this, that there's this thing called SRD 370 where unemployed people who are in extreme vulnerable situations have access to this. And you know, we compared it to the, the American COVID grant you know, to, to try and explain to them. But even the students who did understand were, were pretty shocked, who, who did have a prior knowledge of this, they were shocked. They, they didn't even know that it was, it was possible for them to apply and would have never personally thought to, to apply in their capacity as a, as a registered university student at tertiary institution in South Africa. Um, please give us a moment. Uh, we will continue with this shortly. Honourable members, um, I hope you understand that the, the, our presenters need some time to, you know, confer and um, make sure that they, their responses are to the expectation of the honourable members. Uh, they seem to have finished now. Okay, this response is for the Reverend from the MK Party, honourable member. Um, so, so you asked us, well, well, first you stated that you feel that it is a human problem and not a system problem. Our findings suggest that it could be a system, systemic problem, but we will not rule out the human factor. That is definitely possible. Then you, you, you suggested that by making it harder to apply, we might limit accessibility to, to the SRD grant. That, that's my understanding. And, and, and we feel like the, the recommendations we've put forward, specifically things like the, the rate limiting, we don't feel like that would make it difficult for, for an individual to apply because rate limiting will only apply to those that try to abuse the system. You, you, you then asked about FICA systems at bank, and, or you stated, and, and we feel that this is also a, 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 a good recommendation. The banks could also take over the, the, the verification um, because they have that technology already in place for when people create bank accounts. So, so we do agree with you on that. And then I want to again emphasize the fact that we did not hack any systems, we did not breach any systems. You, you wanted to know whether or not generating ID numbers is allowed and our view of it is that this is allowed because it is a simple algorithm. Um, ID numbers are composed um, what ID numbers are composed of, it is public information, it is published on numerous government websites, including the Western Cape uh, government's website, and all we simply did was use the way, we, we, we took the way that ID numbers are composed, and we just generated hundreds of thousands of these, but it's, it's, it's in line with, with, you know, we, 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 we just used a simple algorithm to, to do it, there was no, nothing illegal about that. Thank you. Um, will that be all? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, to, to continue, um, 
on with our feedback. We, we thank the next honorable member, uh, the fifth uh, responder. I'm not sure what political affiliation you are, but um, we, we welcome that, that story. It, it's a very tragic story to hear, you know, people who've been battling with this issue of, of grant fraud since J uh, J July 2023. Um, that is actually when, when my grant was, was stolen because I turned 18 in July 2023 and I was immediately paid out a grant in July 2023, which, you know, it's, it's a very, very sad situation that the most vulnerable actors in South Africa don't even have a way to dispute that the re uh, phone number registered to, to their SASA grant is not theirs, right? Um, in all our cases, the phone number used um, in, in, in the SASA application was not your personal phone number. Um, so it was a, a fraudster's phone number and um, they, there's no way at all to, to you know, um, change this online or dispute it online. The only way you can do it is, is phoning the call center. And as Mr. Sedras has said, he, he tried that um, multiple times. And today, to this date, um, they, they still have not resolved their, their, that issue. And, and the phone number linked to his Sasa grant is not his. It's a completely fraudster's ID numbers. Um, we... Please give us a moment while we deliberate the last two responses um, to get. Okay, finally, in response to the, the, the statement about the technicalities of our, of our findings, we are willing to, to directly engage with SASA and uh, perhaps compile a report or something like that regarding what we did you know, in terms of the technical details. And then in response to, to your question, Honorable Member, um, you asked about slide eight specifically, what the probability of, of, of it being that the the application rate is so high. And we feel like the probability is extremely low that that is actually possible. It shouldn't be possible that there, are, that there is a 91% application rate. It, 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 it doesn't seem legitimate. And you know, if we, if we look at our findings from our survey, I think that confirms it because over 90% of our survey respondents said that they did not create that application themselves. And then you, you, you asked us about the attitude of Sasa towards us. Um, we, in the media statement, we believe Sasa did confirm a, a most of our findings. And in, in, the, in the SABC interview, I think Via would be able to respond to that. Look, on, on the SABC interview, we, we had the delight of, you know, engaging with someone from Sasa who we, we did try to reach out to before. Um, and, and we weren't doing this from a, oh, I'm a, you know, executive or I'm a, I'm a person who's found this. We are concerned citizens who said, we found this issue. We don't know what to do. And when you search up, all, all we did as, as responsible citizens was call the Sasa hotline. Um, as a matter of fact, in, in all instances of, of this issue, when, whenever Sasa says, you'll, you'll, you'll probably hear them say it, it's, we urge people to call the hotline. But the hotline is not equipped to, to deal with this many fraudulent cases, as we've seen with Mr. Sedras. Um, they are not able to, to deal with all of these people, you know, especially when I remember when, when I phoned the Sasa hotline, I, I, I was on hold for 30 minutes and then the phone just died. So when there are this many 
fraudulent cases, it's important to understand that there is no quick and easy fix. You, you can't say everyone must call the hotline because there are too many cases of this. I'm not sure if Joel has anything to add to that. Thank you, honorable members. Um, you, if you could please um, respond to the follow-up questions and comments. Um, thank you very much to the if I'm correct, six MPs for your input. Um, we understand that we are stressed for time and we'll make a, a effort in you know, giving quick, speedy responses. Um, firstly, to the first MP, um, we understand a lot of your, your, your questions were, were targeted not to us, but the minister. Um, so um, they can, you guys can deal that in a separate capacity. But um, to the questions in which you did give us, we, we do support them. We do think that there should be internal audits conducted and, and that there should be vulnerability assessment and testing done before these tools are deployed to the general public, um, and we, we support that. Secondly, to the DAMP. Firstly, the, the, um, the, the engagement we've had with SASA. So we have reached out to SASA, you know, as we said, in a, in a general citizen's perspective. We didn't get a response back. Um, after the SABC news interviewed last week, um, I did request and reach out personally to Mr. Brenton van Freda, the executive manager and director of grant management, I think, at, at SASA, and requested a, a meeting with him on that day or at his next available point. And I was declined and I was told by him, you know, um, I'm going to give you a number to the IT department. If they don't respond within the next two days, please reach back out. And I never got a response from the IT department. So, um, I then asked Mr. Van Freer and I got a message from, from the Chief Information Officer of SASA stating that um, we'd like to meet urgently with you, you know, tomorrow, now, whatever, but we just didn't have any time to meet with them um, because we're busy students. We have tutorial tests. We have exams to prepare for. We, we have to study. So I advise them due to our, our busy schedule that we'll meet with you either on Wednesday or Thursday when you guys are available. Um, so all of a sudden, we, we hopefully will meet with them after this or on Thursday. Um, the follow-up question from, from the Honorable MP was about um, my personal SASA grant situation. So the bank account in which my, I operate from um, was which I opened when I was, I was, I opened with my father when, when I was 13. Um, and that's where my paycheck was received in. But what the fraudsters were able to do was open a bank account uh, with another bank, right? Not the bank I uh, currently use. And the matter of fact is, is there's no way to, to tell if you have two bank accounts open, right? I, in my personal capacity, knew that I had this one bank account that I was using. I had the card. Um, and I was spending money on that account. But if a fraudster was able to open up a secondary bank account with a completely different bank with a different phone number, I would never know. Um, unless I walk into the bank and say, can I open up a bank account? And then they'll tell you, um, oh, sorry, so you have an, a, a bank account with us already. Um, and then I'm going to let Mr. Cedrus continue um, when dealing with the next um, responses. In response to your question, sir, about the fraud cases and why we have not opened them, the, the reason for us not opening fraud cases is because we don't know who to lay fraud charges against. Is it against SASA or is it against the people who have stolen our identities who we actually don't know? So, so at the moment, we, we are seeking legal, legal advice on, in that regard. Thank you. Um, just to add on to what Mr. Cedras has said um, in regard to that, and it's, it's that we have no way of, of telling who these fraudsters are, um, and that's because the phone numbers which, which were used on our fraudulent SASA applications were not our own, um, and, and you guys might have heard of the, the RICA Act, the RICA Act which regulates telecommunications and states that, you know, back in, in, in the past, you know, you'd have to walk into a physical, like, shop give your ID and they would validate that, upload that to the database. But the truth is that there is re widespread RICA fraud currently in, in today's society, which, you know, does have to be overcome. And that's why we, we when we will, you know, engage further uh, with the investigation, we'll probably end up discovering that the phone numbers on our SASA applications are 
possibly to a person that is deceased or a, a, a person that didn't even realize his ID was fraudulently being used. Following that, we, we received a, a couple of comments um, on the line of, um, sorry, if I am correct, the, the biometric systems and, and whether a, a presentation can be made to, to the committee, you know, to, to save us millions of rands. And we welcome that. Um, we understand that, that by doing something like this, especially if, if an individual is willing to do it for free, I mean, we are, we are doing this for free. So we, we think that there's a lot of talent available in this country of, of cybersecurity experts and people in the IT industry. And we can't wait. Um, I think the, the one gentleman earlier did state we, we can't wait four or five years for an investigation. This is something that needs to be addressed now because if it isn't addressed now, the most vulnerable people in our society are going to get hit the worst because 370, although not a lot of money, is the backbone and the basis of, of the food for them, uh, food for the people who really need it for that month and, and the basic, basic necessities just for them to survive. And, and this is something that, you know, can solve base hunger, you know, in our country. And we, we would love to advocate for that. And without further ado, I'd like to give it back to the chair. Um, I'm not sure if, if there'll be time for any further questions, but thank you very much. Thank you so much. I really want to believe that the presentation that was made has been responded to, and even follow-up questions were asked and responded to as well. So I would like to thank you, um, gentlemen. I, I saw that you started very well with the honorable members and the honorable chairperson. By the end, it was you guys. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen this, but... But I, I really appreciate the fact that you followed protocol right to the end. And so um, I don't, I think the questions that I personally had to you have been covered by colleagues as they were asking questions uh, as a result of your presentation. But I would like to now, um, as I hand over to the, minister, the Honorable Minister, uh, to say that we are now going to be getting a response from SASA, the department, and SASA to the presentation that has just been made. Uh, thank you so much, Honorable Minister. <laughs>